Welcome, everybody, to the Making a Difference Speaker Series hosted by Brilliant Labs. Uh, I'm your host, Alicia Collins. I work at Brilliant Labs as the Director of Creative Learning. And we are very excited to start our first speaker series session for the school year with Dr. Narusha Martin. Welcome. We are super thrilled to hear about all your projects and ideas. Uh, Dr. Narisha Morgan is an interdisciplinary scientist. She's currently working as an assistant professor at Algoma University, and she specializes in cancer biology, neuroscience, and regenerative and electromagnetic medicine, which is the first time I'm hearing this, so I'd love to hear more about it. Um, but she's a brilliant educator as well, and I've been having a lot of interactions with her, uh, and she seems passionate about involving others into creative science and bringing science to the wall. So that's very special about uh, Dr. Morgan. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Really excited to share our work and most importantly, inspire uh, to see where we can drive a lot of our innovation in science. So uh, at any point in time, if you have any questions or some interesting ideas, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so let's get started. Um, the title of my talk, I'm going to be talking about essentially how we can control biological conversations, essentially to potentially one day uh, regrow limbs uh, within our human species. So just a little bit about myself, um, as Alicia mentioned, I identify myself as an interdisciplinary scientist. Um, and what does that really mean? It just means that I bring together principles of information from many different fields within science to answer a common question. And if you see my background, my education is pretty pervasive in the fields of neuroscience, biophysics, and cancer biology. And I had the opportunity to gain some hands-on experience um, internationally in the States at Tufts and at the Wies Institute at Harvard. And in terms of research, what I'm going to be talking about today all fits into this idea of controlling information to either stop cancer which i won't be talking about today but if you have questions i'm happy to talk about it anytime neural cognition or aneural cognition and limb regeneration so let's just jump right in in my lab right now i'm focused on what we call information processing so just for a minute i want you to sit back and think you're in this busy city uh, as outlined in this picture here and pretend you're having a conversation with your friend there is you and there's your friend you're trying to relay an information through a conversation, but you're in a very busy and noisy city. So it might be difficult for you to relay that information properly. And you know, in, um, in some circumstances, that information might be confused or not even relayed. Let's take another context. Let's think about a nice, open, quiet field. But now you are on one end of the field and your friend is far away. So in the same context, just because you may be close or in a high distance away from your neighbor, how the information is processed is critically important to getting the right message across. And that's something that I'm really interested in my lab and, and just fundamentally is how biological systems essentially process that information, that biological information. And if we can find innovative technologies to harness and rewrite that information to whatever state that we want. So let's take a, a step forward in looking at biology. So what we're looking at here is the development of uh, cells. So each cell is going to divide into various compartments. And what's interesting to note, and I'll, I'll pause this right here, you need to understand that each individual cell needs to communicate with its neighbor of who they are and who they're dividing into. So just from looking at this, um, this uh, video, it might be hard to see what kind of biological information relates to the structure. So if we kind of jump ahead, you see that this division of cells, the information that's being divided and translated to with each other and around the entire developing embryo actually will involve a specific shape. And that shape is to a frog. So even within development, we see that frogs from their tadpole stage where they have these cute little legs and tails that through development, they actually lose these structures when they become fully 
adult rock. So it's very interesting when we look at development that we somehow are able to talk to each other's cells and to get a really unified plan of, of a structure. So then let's ask that question. How then do you build structure? So if you were to think of a structure, you might think of something like a house. So how would one build a house? You need two things. You need the parts and you need the plans. So you need the actual nuts and bolts and a map or a plan to figure out where those uh, pieces go to get a nice, beautiful, organized structure. Now, if you translate that into biology, like, you know, the structure of a limb, what you would need are the fundamental parts and plans. So the parts in these case are various kinds of cells and tissues, and the plans are genetically encoded in our DNA on how these cells need to be organized so that you are able to grow a very complex structure that is functional, much like our hands. So now, so I'm telling you that cells need to talk to each other. How do cells talk? They don't, are they talking like us, if you're hearing me through your microphone? It's a little bit different. So these cells in your body, they typically communicate, and we have a lot of information in how they communicate through what we call transcriptional control or through molecules and proteins. And at the side of our cell, what we call the membrane, there is a communication mechanism called the ligand receptor. Uh, model. So you probably may have seen this or heard about this and what happens typically is that there's a molecule that binds to the receptor, that information gets somehow into the cell and the cell decides what they want to do with that information. Now this is very simple and we know that biology is not that simple. So let's look at what actually happens. This is that complicated network. So let's say for example you are eating lunch. It's about lunchtime and your hormone insulin were to spike. How does that information of what you ate gets translated down into making the protein insulin so that you're able to digest what you ate? So this complicated network, we have a great understanding thanks to uh, chemicals, but how do we control that? And typically the controlling mechanisms in terms of how cells talk to each other is well understood in our genes. So this is what we call a gene regulatory network where the genes inside of your nuclei of each of your cells are able to control this big network of molecules that are talking to each other. Now this might be very confusing to you and it's confusing to me, but this is how cells talk to form shape. So if I were to tell you that this big network of molecules actually controls the formation of a shape, could you tell me what shape this makes? I would be really surprised if you could, because sometimes it's hard for me too. This gene regulatory network actually forms limbs. So we have a really, really good understanding of how cells communicate with each other through molecules. It's very complicated, but along with the complexity, it's very hard to regulate these things because just because you manipulate one molecule or one gene, it doesn't mean that you might change the overall shape. So what we need is sort of like your master key. Is there a master key that I can use in biology where I can turn on a signal and it'll change the message of cell patterning and making different structures within the human body? The answer is yes. We have this thing called membrane physiology or membrane dynamics. So as I mentioned, on the surface of your cells, you have these proteins that essentially make each and every cell electric. And these changes in membrane potential actually can control the proteins and genes on the inside where you get this feedback mechanism where the changing of the outside membrane potential can actually change the proteins and that changes the membrane potential and you get this really nice feedback cycle. So you can now imagine if you wanted to create some therapeutics or drugs or treatments for any kinds of diseases, I'd like to find the master key that does all this. So the way that people are looking on how cells talk is this field called bioelectricity. Bioelectricity is essentially, as I would say, is each individual cell has the ability to be electric. And when I talk about electricity, people usually think, oh, it's the heart or it's the brain that has the electricity that talks to each other. But in fact, through what I just talked about, membrane physiology, 
every little cell in your body, your eyes, your hands, your toes, every cell has the ability to be electric. And these electric cells can be manipulated in various different ways, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So what can we do by harnessing these electric signals? Well, we can control cellular movement. How cells move, you can apply a little electric signals to these cells and they can control in terms of how a cell moves in its environment. You can see in these images or in this video that these really bright green areas are areas where there's high electric signals telling the cell what's in its environment so they can move towards those areas. Another method that cells use you, uh, these electric states on the membrane is through cell division, which we just talked about. So they can communicate with each other to say, I'm the top part of the cell, I'm the neighbor, or I'm front and back. And you know, the name of the game for today's conversation is we can use membrane physiology to actually grow a whole limb from an after an amputation or a tissue injury, which I'll talk about today. So membrane physiology, the way we view it is like this big master key that's able to turn on and kickstart biological processes. And we can use that to kind of listen in on what the cells and tissues are saying. So with that being said, let's talk about regrowing limbs in the field of limb regeneration. And when we have an amputation or some sort of injury, the challenge that we face in limb regeneration is to actually coordinate all of the molecular dynamics that's happening inside of the tissue to get a very specific shape. So if you were to zoom in in each of these structures, what you'll see is that you have bone, nerve, blood vessels, skin, all of those molecular processes need to coordinate with each other in a very precise dance with each other. And the most important thing is to stop. Once they reach the right size and shape, they need to stop. Or could you imagine having one hand bigger than the other? So this is a reason why we need to have a really fine control on how cells talk to each other to get the right shape after regeneration. And unlike humans, some animals have already figured this out in evolution. There are a species of um, salamanders known as axolotls. Axolotls are a very unique and actually cute species which has the ability to regenerate most of their organs. So if there was a state of damage, these axolotls after injury are able to fully regenerate most of their tissue. So after amputation, they have a pool of stem cells in their tissue that allows them to grow a fully functioning uh, limb. There are other aquatic organisms, which what we call metamorphically limited. And these guys are similar to humans, where in their embryonic states or in their young um, developmental stages, they typically have the ability to regenerate or regrow lost tissue, but as they grow into adulthood, they lose that ability. So here in these frogs, when they're in these uh, tadpole stages, we see that if there was any kind of loss in their tail for some kind of injury, within about seven days, they're able to fully regrow that uh, tissue back out. But as they grow into their adulthood and they become full frogs, they lose that ability. And this is a good model system to kind of relate to humans because as when we are younger, uh, up until the actual age of four, we have the ability to regenerate some parts of our body. For example, our liver is able to regenerate if there was any kind of damage. And interestingly enough, the first part of our finger, the digit, if there was any kind of injury where we were to slice off the top of our fingers, up to the age of about four or five, you're able to regrow that tip back out. But if you were an adult and we lose the tip of our finger, it's gone. It's, uh, we don't have the ability to regrow it back. So the frogs have that same kind of developmental loss in regeneration. So just to kind of show you here, if you were to, these are these numbers essentially just represent how old the frogs are, if you were to amputate them in their late developmental stage, they actually regrow back this spike. So in their late adulthood, if you were to amputate their legs, they grow back this what we call hypomorphic spike. 
this spike is absolutely useless to the frog. It's not able to swim, it's not able to eat, it's not able to reproduce. So it's technically going to harm the species in its development. So what we have decided is, could we then, if, the, if these organisms had the ability in their younger days, can we give that information back to the adulthood tissues to give them the ability to regrow their limbs? So that's the strategy that I'm going to talk about today. And one of the methods is to communicate with these biological tissues in various electrical contexts to kind of give them the message to regrow back the tissue that they once lost. So when we talk about regeneration and giving the ability for an individual to gain use of their limbs again, typically we talk about prosthetics and they've come a long way and they've helped a lot of people. However, there's a lot of drawbacks to prosthetics and robotic arms besides looking very cool. They um, unfortunately don't have a lot of precise control in terms of how you can navigate and pick up certain things. A lot of robotic advances are in the works right now in biomedical engineering where they're trying to overcome this challenge, but we're still not there yet. So the best approach would be to essentially kickstart your own developmental processes that we had in when we were embryos developing in our mother's uh, wombs and give the signals back again to regrow limbs. So in biomedical engineering advances, what we've done now is we've created scaffolds using cool different biomaterials where we can now seed cells into these biomaterials, transplant them back into the broken or lost tissue and give that information back in the form of molecules to regrow whatever tissue that we want. And what we see here is a really cool advance that has been made where they have created scaffolds of just limbs by decelling them, meaning that you've taken all of the cells away from these limbs and you've created a nice scaffold, essentially a nice canvas for you to paint and deliver whatever kind of cell you want to create that communication between them again to create a functioning limb. So the big question that we have on the table is, can we do it again? We, during our young developmental stages, we had the ability to regenerate we did it once during embryonic development. Can we kickstart those mechanisms like a turnkey and give adults the ability to regenerate lost tissues or lost uh, limb or appendages? So to do that, I had to come up with two challenges to solve. The first challenge is to create an environment where the cells can comfortably talk to each other. When you have an injury, typically what happens is the cells go in a flight or fight mode where they try to wall up the wound site, create a scar, preventing any kind of infection from occurring. But we need to create an environment where we don't form that scar and instead we form a new pattern tissue. The next challenge was uh, to figure out what that chemical signal is so we can turn on those say uh, those conversations without micromanaging every single sentence that's being said by those cells so if you imagine our challenge is to not only create the environment but we want to create the master key to turn on that cellular signal to regrow a whole complex uh, limb so let's tackle the first challenge let's create a micro environment where the cells can talk to each other and there's a lot of advances in biomedical engineering where we use natural products as scaffolds so the cells can essentially communicate with each other. And in our work, we used silk. Yep, this is the same silk that you use to develop fabrics, maybe that Gucci scarf. We use those same silk proteins to um, develop scaffolds so the cells can essentially seed and talk to each other. So just to kind of go through the biological process, we take these silk um, cocoons from silkworms and we isolate a specific protein called fibroin. There is another protein called sericin, and this is a, a sticky protein that we don't like to use. It actually does the opposite of what we want in terms of our scaffold building. So we discard it. And through a lot of processing, we take that fibroin and you get a cotton-like uh, substance that we can now dissolve in a hydrogel and now this is a great scaffold for us to now use for drug delivery or stem cell delivery 
or now we can start communicating with um, the cellular tissue. So what you're looking at here are the actual devices that we use in our limb regeneration. The outside is a silicone sleeve that we use to attach to the frog leg. And inside is the silk hydrogel, the environment that has the chemical messages to tell the cells, okay, don't form a scar now, start talking to each other in a very coordinated way to start rebuilding the nerves, the bone and the muscle. So in our experiment, what we did is we took adult frogs, we amputated safely their limbs, we waited for the animals to be recovered, we attached our devices, and again, if you zoomed into that silk hydrogel, you, you would find five uh, chemicals that we strategically picked to communicate with in each individual cell to um, allow for this regenerative process. And this took, technically two days, and the regeneration process wasn't as quick. It takes about 18 months for these cells to coordinate with each other to create these limbs. So about nine months into our regenerative period, if you were to look into what's happening, our animals that were given no treatment at all, you can see that they grow this hypomorphic spike. The spike, again, doesn't have any nerve inside of it, no bone, no muscle. This is essentially not useful for the animal to survive in its environment. Now, I want you to keep in your mind that we only delivered these tissue, these drugs for only one day. After a day, we remove the device and we let the tissue do their own thing. And nine months later, we see these very, very intricate patterning forming. And I'd like you to draw your attention to up here. We start to see that we're starting to get skin cells coming back. So the cells start to think, okay, we can take the information from the tissue above and kind of learn from those tissues to start growing and patterning the cells around us. And if we kind of look at the full 18 months, what we see is in the animals that received no treatment at all, you don't get a lot of patterning. In the animals that received only the gel, no chemical message, we see that they have a longer spike but no patterning in their tissues. But here with just one day of treatment of a chemical message, you start to see these intricate shapes now where the, cell, where the animals are able to start utilizing them effectively for swimming and grabbing and, and so forth. So they're not absolutely perfect yet, but this is again after only just a one uh, day treatment of these chemical messages. So we have advancements that can be made where we can these questions like what's going to happen if we reapply these drugs or if we apply different chemical messages? Could we then get more intricate patterning um, with that? One more uh, advancement that I like to show that we that we got, which is super exciting for me, is that we've kind of reestablished their ability to feel with this new tissue, which is super exciting. So in this video, what you'll see is um, if it'll work, yeah, you'll see us sort of lightly touching the new growth of tissue with these force probes. We just slightly touch them with heavier, heavier force, and we see that the animal is not really responding because it doesn't feel what is being probed into their, their tissue. At the end there, you see that I kind of slightly nudge the frog just to kind of show you that they're alive and well. They just don't feel the, the stimulation that's being presented to them. But even though in these animals, you don't get a lot of patterning in some of the, the tissue, we see that even with the lightest force, these animals are able to respond. This means that they can feel again. So with our treatment, we have this ability to recapitulate nerve growth um, for such a long distance of tissue compared to the whole animal with just a one day treatment of chemicals. So, that's some exciting advancements with our frog limb regeneration. Now, we're long ways ahead, but this is the first step to say that we have now the right microenvironment to start communicating with the cells in all sorts of intricate ways to get to our end goal, which is making a fully functioning limb that is your own without being transplanted or prosthetic. Now, with that being said, let's jump on to project two, which is still related to project one, which is again, information processing. 
how can we take what we know about how cells process information? In everything we talked about, we talked about nerve tissue, we talked about um, cells communicating with each other. And one problem I'd like to bring to your attention is this thing called phantom pain. Individuals who typically lose their limb, there's communication with their nerves throughout their body, their brain, in terms of how cells are supposed to communicate with each other to grow the, um, the, new, the new limb. In the case where you don't have new limb growth, what happens is these cells, these nerve tissue don't communicate properly and they give the sensation that there is a limb there when there actually isn't. And that's what we call phantom limb. So everything in terms of limb regeneration and pain has to do with uh, information processing using a nervous system. And if you look at other organisms that communicate with their environment and to each other, most of these organisms have a brain. Birds that signal to each other that it's spring. Uh, snails leave mucus behind to tell their neighbors and predators information about them and their surrounding is all controlled by their nervous system. Even in complex primates like monkeys and chimpanzees, how they communicate, even though it may not be verbal or it could be just body language, it's all controlled through some form of brain and nerve tissue. And again, pretty peacocks, in terms of how they communicate with their partners for reproduction, it's all controlled through nerve tissue. So what if I told you there is a whole organism out there that is able to process information, is very smart, but it has no nerve tissue. And I'm sure you've heard of slime mold, and that's what we're going to talk about next, is how can this organism that has no brain, it has no remnants of a nerve tissue, how is it able to be you know, intelligent by solving these complex problems. So what you see here is the infamous slime mold or Physarum polycephalum. In fact, it's actually the wrong name. Slime mold is not a mold at all. It is not a fungus. It's actually part of the protist species. So uh, fun fact, actually, the colloquial name for Physarum or slime mold, if you're into nature walks or hiking, is actually dog vomit because it's looks like duck vomit. So Physarum polycephalum or slime mold um, has always been associated with being intelligent. And this, this species right here is actually one individual cell. So if you see in this diagram where we've plated a, a large piece of Physarum, it has the ability to create this web-like network. And if you were to zoom in into each of those tubules, they are all one individual cell. And these physarum, these slime molds have the ability to grow up to meters in length, where again, it's just one cell. Looking inside of the physarum, what you see is that these tiny little blue dots, and there are millions of them inside of these physarum, these tiny little blue dots are nuclei. So they're not compartmentalized like the embryo that we saw earlier in our, in our presentation. These are all scattered throughout the, um, the tubes, suggesting that this is not a typical organism that we might see on how information is processed across its body. So if you see here, this image is looking at this point in the, the physarum's growth, which is what we call the front. The front of the physarum is pretty much like its head. It's what senses around it. And once it senses its information, it has to um, send that signal across its entire body of what, what it's experiencing in its um, environment. So that's just a little bit about the anatomy of the physarum. In terms of its abilities, I'm not sure if you've heard, they're pretty smart. And why we say that they're smart is because they're able to do tasks similar in efficiency to those that do have a brain or uh, some kind of nervous tissue. They can anticipate events. They can make decisions that benefit themselves and they can solve mazes. So in this, um, I hope this video works. See here, I'll just quickly point out, in the middle of this maze, we have, um, we have a food reward and on the edge of the maze with that yellow blob is the physarum and i'll just 
play this back again for you, you'll see that as it's deciding to you know, try to find the, the food source, the physarum kind of decides on both sides before it determines that it's able to solve the maze essentially by finding the most effective path. And what's interesting to note is I've done a hundred of the maze and hopefully you'll get the chance too. These physarum have the ability to crawl over the, the maze, um, the walls, but they don't. They choose to kind of traverse through these gel-like substance to kind of find the most effective most effective path. So that's super interesting and researchers don't exactly know why or how this organism um, is able to solve these, these complex mazes. Um, another feature where some individuals will be like, are physarum actually intelligent? And how can we compare those to organisms that have a brain? And to answer that question, we have to talk about habituation. Habituation is a fundamental principle in cognition or thinking or intelligence. And what that means is when you are presented with some kind of stimulus over and over and over again, you get used to it. And that's just a feature of neural tissue. So if someone were to present a beep, a repetitive beep for hours, eventually your brain will learn to ignore it because it has a bit habituated to that signal. So there was a brilliant study that was done by Audrey de Satur where she tried to see if physarum has the ability to habituate, essentially become a, immune to a, a, a negative stimuli. So physarum, we've through trial and error realized that they hate high salt environments. So what she made was a maze. And in this maze, and I'll kind of explain this real quick, where on one side, she had the physarum. On the other side of this bridge, she had a food source. And they typically like to eat oats, the same Quaker oats you and I eat. And the middle of the, the two, the two uh, pods, she had a bridge. And in the bridge was this salt, a high salt bridge. And on day one, you can see that the physarum did, tried its best to kind of go around the bridge to try to get to the food source. She took the same physarum and did it again, allowed it to grow and gave it a, the same bridge over and over and over again for six days. And you can see that by the third day, it's pretty much habituated to this salt bridge, pretty much understanding that, okay, I don't care. I am immune to this negative stimuli. So this was one of the first insights, along with the maze learning, that we may be able to decode their intelligent signals through having them go through these processes that normal brain tissue or brain tissue organisms go through as well. And the last piece of um, evidence that I want to share with you to show that physarum are incredibly intelligent is their ability to be efficient on how they move. Remember, this piece of physarum that you see in this big network here is one individual cell. So it makes sense for the physarum to kind of conserve its nuts and bolts without expending a big amount of it to grow in a big blob. So it needs to be very efficient. And so what you're seeing here in this experiment is a um, hub or a network that was artificially created by humans as the railway point. So this is a map where each dot is an oat where you would find a railway station in Japan. And what the physarium, they put a physarium in a point and they, at, they allowed the physarium to explore and create the most efficient network in terms of connecting between these, these dots. And what you see is this is the slime mold network, if you kind of simplify it. And this is the actual Tokyo network, and it's fairly similar in terms of the hubs that, that are being created. So again, this gives us some insights in how intelligent or the capability of this organism that has no way of um, processing neural information. So the big question is, how does it process information? Where is it coming from? Where is it getting processed if it doesn't have a brain? So the answer to that is to look into each individual tube. So the physarum's anatomy is fairly simple if you were to look inside. It's basically putting a big straw inside of a little straw. 
and each straw has fluid going inside of it. And you see that here in this video. So this is a, um, a real time pulsing action video, what we call cytoplasmic streaming of the Pfizerum's uh, network. So these tubes essentially are moving fluid in and around those networks. And that is probably one way the Pfizerum is able to communicate with its surroundings. So what I did is I wanted to see exactly where this information is going and how it's going. So again, just to give you some insights here, if you take a, a slime mold piece and you give it a cross section, as I said, you'll see one tube, a smaller tube inside of a larger tube. And what I did was I injected some fluorescent beads that I can view through a microscope and I could follow that bead in and around the tubes of the physerum. And what you see is this video. So this is again, real time of all the beads around how fast that fluid goes. And I'm not sure if you noticed that, that those, um, those fluids are able to go in two directions. They're able to go forward and backward. And you see that in one of the veins, it actually stopped moving. And you might ask why. And the answer is, Pfizerum actually hate light. They like growing in very dark and humid environments. So by me applying light through the microscope, the Pfizerum sees it as a um, sort of predator prey reaction and it stops moving um, its shuttle streaming or the fluid inside of that uh, vein. If you were to take off the light and put the um, Pfizerum back in the dark, those veins will start moving their fluid again. So that's a really cool way of on how these Pfizerum communicate from let's say one part of the body of the Pfizerum to the other part, so from A to B. And if you see this in terms of oops, the um, maze development itself, you can see that the Pfizerum is able to communicate through the shuttle streaming from one part to the other through these back and forth flow movements of the fluid inside of it. So one experiment that I want to share with you is, can we push this idea of Pfizerian being intelligent to the next level? Could we create an experiment where we can test the ability of Pfizer slime mold to make decisions at long distances without exploring its environment? Because you could say, you know, the Pfizerum is going to explore the environment and it's going to pick the best choice and then move from there. But if this organism is truly intelligent, it needs to be able to sense its environment in a unique way and then make a decision. So in this experiment, we place the Pfizerum in the middle of a Petri dish. On either side, we put glass discs of, that were just glass. There's no chemicals on it. There's no food on it. They're just inert gas, so we, uh, glass. So we put three discs on one side and one disc on the other. The reason for putting these disc, glass discs and no food is because we didn't want the Pfizerum to be attracted to a chemical. We wanted to see if it was able to sense sort of physical changes, something that was heavier versus lighter, and if that could be a way that the Pfizerum is able to communicate with its environment. So we allow the Pfizerum to uh, explore the area and we see whether it's able to cross one boundary or the other and we can see what decision it's made. So let's look at the video. Again, the Pfizerum is placed in the middle and on either side, you have heavy or lighter disc options. So let's watch what the Pfizerum does. And this takes about 24 hours for the Pfizerum to grow. So it's very, very slow. So you see the Pfizerum very clearly doesn't explore its environment, but it makes a very clear beeline to the heavier mass. And then if you didn't catch that, we'll look at these little snapshots that I took throughout the decision-making process that within the first, let's say seven hours, the Pfizerum doesn't make a lot of um, choice in, in the matter and about 10 hours just following the blue dots, the amount of Pfizerum on either side is pretty even. And again, about 12 hours in. It's not until 14 hours after it's given the chance to make a choice, does it make a decision, a clear decision to grow towards the heavier mass. 
So this brings up another question then. What is the Pfizerium doing for 14 hours when it's forced to make a decision between a heavy and a lighter object? So to answer that question, you gotta look in deeper to what the Pfizerium is doing on the agar gel. So this is one vein that we zoomed in on. And what you'll see is the Pfizerium, they tug, they physically sense their environment by what we call mechanosensation. They're, they're exploring their environment, they're bringing in stimuli through mechanical information in their environment. So if that's true, if an organism is able to gain information by tugging its environment, if I were to constantly shake it up, it's not, it shouldn't be able to detect what's in its environment. And that's exactly what we did in this experiment, where we took the same plates and we put them on a rocker where it's constantly shaking what's in its environment. And we then looked at its decision. And oddly enough, once you allow the same Pfizerium that used to be able to make a decision using uh, this mechanical sensation, when you force it to make a decision when it's in a constant moving environment, you can see that they lose that ability. They don't have a clear choice. They kind of choose both. So they make a error in terms of which decision they um, are forced to choose. So I hope I've convinced you that in two very different model systems, how information is processed is very different and it gives us some insights on how we can harness this information to learn more about the model systems and develop therapeutics. And I'll leave you off with what we're doing next. What we're now doing is learning what we learned with the frog experiments and the slime mode experiments to now rewrite cells using the information that we get from them. So essentially we're reprogramming cells, specifically cancer, back into their healthy states. To do that, I kind of want to give you an analogy. So imagine these two uh, superheroes or supervillains. On the left, you have the typical Batman. And on the right, you have the Joker. The Batman, if you know their origin story, they, uh, he grew up in Gotham City and grew up with a lot of traumatic events in his life. But he's considered the hero in a lot of these comic books. The Joker, he also grew up in Gotham City, had traumatic events also happen to him, but he ended up being the villain. So this is how we essentially should view cancer because cancer and healthy tissue are all in the same microenvironment. But what makes one good and what makes the other one bad? And this is where we're trying to harness what that subtle information is where you get in normal scenarios in healthy uh, tissue, you get a healthy microenvironment. And in cancer state, you get these dark, terrible microenvironments where they now become a very terrible cancerous tissue. So what we're doing now is taking these healthy environments and putting them in cancerous environments to kind of change the conversation. If I take something that's negative and put it in a healthy environment, can I change that information that's being communicated with each other to make that cancer cell go back into its healthy state? And to do that, we have three approaches. Similar to our regeneration project, we need to control the microbiome environment using biomedical engineering techniques where we use skill, silk as a scaffold so that the cells can and the chemicals can communicate with each other. Step two is to stop the talking. To stop the talking, we use biophysical signals, so the same vibration type technology that you would get in tuning forks to communicate between two cancer tissue that, hey, you need to stop this terrible signal of growing very rapidly. And three, to reprogram using what we learn from regenerative medicine and in biology to create uh, healthy tissue using normalized um, techniques. And the reason for why we do this is because cancer is a devastating disease that not only impact the individuals that have them, but a lot of their family members and people close to them. And cancer is something that's not going away, unfortunately, where we're getting significant increases in colorectal cancers and breast cancers as well, despite having um, treatments against them currently. And the last bit, who? Um, my lab is comprised of talented individuals 
that um, have big picture um, ideas and intricate ways to synergize these ideas. And hopefully with them, we'll make significant advances in this cancer cell reprogramming uh, venture that we're on. And that's it. Thank you so much. I want to thank um, all my mentors, mentees, and funding agencies for helping making the advances that we've made today. Any questions? Wow. Thank you. This has been super incredible. I'm still thinking about so many things. Uh, thank you for stimulating us with such amazing ideas. Um, we are unfortunately short of time, but hopefully we'll have some questions. So maybe I'll take one if people are okay waiting. Uh, Mary is asking, first of all, she's saying, thank you for this mind blowing presentation. How did you come up with silk as a protein base? And also, how does the stop the talking element differ from surgeries that remove those bad cells? Right. Great questions. I'll tackle the first one. So we came up with using silk because um, a lot of previous literature has showed that the silk actually suppresses the immune system and adding a bioactive or a natural biomaterial in the environment. We don't want to target the immune system because the immune system can actually form scars. So. Um, that's the reason why we picked uh, silk. It has a, a lot of uh, biophysical properties that we know about to um, use them in our therapies. And the second question, how does the stop talking element differ from surgeries? So in surgery, what you're doing is you're physically removing the cancer cell, but surgery is never perfect and you leave some of these cells behind. And these cells has the ability to kind of get that conversation going again to grow into larger tumors. So the, the only way is to kind of get them to go back into their healthy states, to kind of turn back time on their conversation of being a cancerous tissue. Thank you again so much. And I would like to share with everybody that if you are interested in doing the slime wall exploration challenge uh, that Dr. Morgan just explained, I'm sharing a link in the chat and I will also send this um, in uh, the follow-up email, but you can request for that. Let us know that you're interested a little bit about your school, how many students are there, and if you would like a kit, and then we'll follow up with you um, about the next steps. Um, and it's very exciting. We're trying this for the first time, collaborating with the speaker, and from what I can see, I'm already very like pumped up and very excited. So hopefully we'll ex continue exploring these ideas that we discussed in the presentation um, and, and let's see what we can build on this and what we can create. And this is kind of like opening of doors as some of you are explaining in the chat, but let's continue being curious and explore. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, just send us an email and I hope the Morgan okay that we can reach out to you. Uh, I'll check out your contact as well. Uh, but thank you again. Um, we're really grateful for you for this opportunity. Um, it's super amazing presentation and lots of ideas. Um, thank you again for joining us and we will see everybody next month with another exciting session. Hope everybody you have a great one. Um, and uh, yeah, please write to us about the kit that I mentioned. Uh, and I'll also send a feedback from about the talk. Um, so till then, you guys enjoy and have a great one.